All right. Well, we want to thank you for getting the time change right. Let's make sure if anybody comes in in uh, about 20 minutes or so that we all uh, turn and stare at them. <laughs> Give them uh, the friendly church growl, as it were. Um, yeah, this one's not as fun as the fall one, right? This one we lose the hour. And uh, so it's a little bit rough. I, I had to drive home from uh, Hamilton yesterday because we were down there. My son had a basketball tournament. Um, but we made it back and we're here. And they did, actually. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's good because um, they haven't done a lot of that this year. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was nice to turn the tables a little bit there. As we turn uh, into the spring season, soon enough, it is warming up, which is, which is an encouraging sign. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, we are continuing our series that we started last week called Jesus Is, and we're looking at the ancient prophecies about Jesus, uh, what they said about him, and how he fulfilled them. Really about who he is. Last week we looked at the title, Son of God, Son of God. And Psalm chapter 2 said, you are my son, you are my son. And the context was it was written about King David as he was coronated the king over Israel, but there was something deeper being communicated here, and it was that the New Testament shows us that David was speaking beyond his own situation. He was actually prophesying about God's one and only son. So the first point we saw was that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, not a Son of God, as in, you know, we're all the children of God, but rather the Son of God, an exclusive, exclusive relationship. He and He alone shares in the nature of His Father and enjoys all the rights and privileges of divinity. Jesus reinforced this identity throughout His ministry. He welcomed people to see Him for who He really was, and He welcomes us to do the same, to see him as the Son of God. So we ask the question, have I embraced God's one and only Son? This is what he puts to each one of us, to accept him as the Son of God. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, his only begotten Son. And the second point is this, the Son is above everything. Jesus is so much higher than anything or anyone else. He's higher than any life experience we could have, any other person we might know, higher than even the angels. Through his incarnation, death, and resurrection, he did what no angel could ever do. He brought an even greater spotlight upon himself. Because of who he is, the Son of God, because of what he's done, died in our place, and rose again, we get to look back so we can look up and direct others to do the same, to look up to Jesus, the Son of God. And the question is, what or who am I putting my confidence in? Because really, at the end of the day, we want to be putting everything, all of our trust and faith into Jesus, the Son of God. And finally, to reject the Son is to reject God himself. Our human nature rebels against the rule of the King because we want to be in charge, right? We want to direct our own way, go our own path. And therefore, a strong warning comes in the Scriptures. Honor the Son of God or face His wrath. And certainly Jesus reinforced this theme when He said, enter through the narrow gate because wide is the road that leads to destruction, but the way to life is narrow. So, Jesus, the Son of God. Today we want to talk about Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And we're going to look at Psalm chapter 8 to get started here. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And verse 4, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? So, son of man here means humanity in general. In a way, we are all the son of man, right? We come from other human beings. I haven't met a person yet who wasn't from people. I mean, some it's questionable, but as far as I know, we all had a mother and a father, 
right? That's kind of the only way we get here. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Some science 101 here this morning. So, uh, and that's why the psalmist David is in awe because he says, we're just people. We are just sons of men or, you know, people, mankind, whatever word you want to use. And so how can God, the one who spoke the sun, moon, earth, and stars into existence, the one who holds the universe together simply by his will, how can he be mindful of the son of man? How can he give us the time of day, this life, this opportunity, this moment of grace, this provision? And he's just, you know, flabbergasted by this as he thinks about this incredible reality because ultimately we are dust, right? We came ultimately from the dust of the earth and we will return to the dust of the earth in the end. So here's the point. As sons of men, we are fragile. We are fragile creatures. Growing up, of course, we think we are invincible. And I was no exception. You know, uh, ripping around on a skateboard or bicycle or on a swing or what have you. I remember trying to climb, climb a slide, but you know, grabbing the side of the slide and going up like this, sort of horizontally. And it was one of these big 10 or 12 foot slides that are illegal now, essentially. And I think I was about three years old on a family trip or something. And I don't know what happened, but one way or another, I was hanging from near the top and then I lost, fell down. Thankfully, I think it was like a sandy beach area, but uh, it wasn't a good situation. It was something bad happened in the back. It could have been a lot worse. Thankfully, we, you know, came away walking. But uh, we are fragile, aren't we? Things like this can and do happen. And we come to learn that, you know, we're not invincible. We're continually reminded of how fragile this life is when we think about uh, terminal disease or crippling injury or tragic accident, loss of function, memory, and loss of life. When somebody dies, when somebody dies um, sort of before their time, or we didn't see it coming, and all of a sudden their life is cut short, and they're no longer with us, and we're reminded how fragile life is. This whole coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic challenge that we're facing, it's been hard, right? Because people are struggling to get, get a handle on it, struggling to deal with it, and some are sort of dismissing it, and others are sort of going overboard with it. And, you know, you have folks with the, the, the face mask and, and, you know, wash your hands a thousand times a day and don't, don't get close to people, stay home and all the rest of it. And, you know, it, it, ultimately people are trying to figure out what to do with this. We're trying to figure it out, right? Because it's kind of this new virus and it's attacking people and people are getting sick and people are dying, of course. And it's just yet another reminder about how fragile we are as human beings. And a lot of people, when we're confronted with our human nature, our temporary nature, if you want to say, uh, because of the way we are struck down by loss, tragedy, ultimately death, and we say, where is God? You know, if God was so loving, if God was so powerful, why couldn't he have intervened? Why couldn't he have just, you know, prevented this virus from happen, happening or prevented, you know, this evil act from taking place. Stop that person from doing that. Stop this natural disaster. Whatever the case might be, why couldn't he stop all this pain and suffering if he is so loving and so powerful? And that's a fair question. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 80. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root of your right hand, has planted the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. So the context here, you have Israel praying for restoration after being overwhelmed by a foreign power. Uh, may well have been written during the Babylonian captivity in Israel, 
is the Son of Man in this context, that is, God's Son, his child, the people of Israel, if you will. But could there have been a, a, a prophetic overtone to this passage? Enter Jesus some 500 or more years after this was written, doing his ministry in Israel to the same people this was written about years, centuries before, healing scores of people, forgiving sins, and teaching all who were willing to listen. And what was his favorite title for himself? Not Messiah, not the Christ, not Savior, not Lamb of God, not even his name, Jesus, not the Son of God, like we talked about last week, but what? Son of Man, Son of Man, used over 80 times in the New Testament, and all of them but one are in the Gospels. It actually doesn't occur in the New Testament letters, which is interesting, further highlighting the fact that this was the term Jesus preferred for himself. Some famous verses where he used the term, he said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. The Son of Man will be three days and nights in the belly of the earth, just like Jonah. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Why was Jesus so big on this title, Son of Man? Perhaps it was because it would have caught his hearers by surprise that he was using this title. The Israelites, familiar with the title from the ancient scriptures, would have asked, who is this guy calling himself the Son of Man over and over again? For one thing, they knew that he was highlighting his humanity. Because as we saw, we are all sons of men in that regard. It was sort of like he was saying, hey, I know that, you know, it looks like I'm extra special, and I am, to be fair, but I'm also one of you guys. I'm from you. I'm among you. I'm with you. I'm one of you. But for those tuned to deeper spiritual truths, they knew this guy is claiming to be something much more than just another one of us. He's claiming to be the promised Messiah, the Savior of Israel. So why not just cut to the chase? Why not just say, the Messiah has come to do such and such? Why do you have to keep using this title, Son of Man? You know, why not just say, the Messiah has come? Well, if he did that, if he did that, it might have provoked earlier persecution. You know, people would have said, this guy's calling himself the Messiah out and out, you know, regularly. And people may well have come against him sooner than they did. In the end, it didn't matter. He was persecuted. He was arrested. He was tried and condemned and ultimately crucified. But would it have happened even earlier if he used the, the, title, the title Messiah uh, earlier on? Perhaps. Son of Man was a little bit more subtle, you see. But it was also poignant because it connected so well with his earthly ministry. Look at this verse from Hebrews chapter 4. This is an incredible uh, verse. This is a great one. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. There you go. Tempted in every way, as we are. Jesus didn't become partly human, right, in the incarnation. He became fully human. And as a human being, Jesus faced temptations just like me and you. Jesus faced temptations to give in to, to lust and, and hate and greed and embellishment and selfish ambition, and you fill in the blank for the temptation of your choice. It says he was tempted in every way, at all points, tested, tempted. He faced all these things and more, but he never gave in. He overcame. Here's the point. Jesus, the Son of Man, relates with us. Jesus, the Son of Man, relates with us. Why? Because he has lived this life. 
with all its myriad of daily temptations that you and I face. And, by the way, its share of hardships and losses. Jesus understands because he has faced them. He has experienced them himself. I love the story in the Gospels of the uh, death. It's a sad story because it's the death of Lazarus from the town of Bethany. And this was a close friend of Jesus, so much so that when he heard about his death, the shortest verse in the Bible, two words, I think it's John 11 and 45, says, Jesus wept. He just cried because his friend died. And that hurt. He loved his friend, Lazarus. And he cried, much like how you have cried about some loss or hardship that you have faced. Jesus understands because he has been there. He has felt it. He has experienced it himself as the Son of Man. And this is why he can relate with us, you see. And this is why the gospel is so awesome, because it is God who has come near, come close to become a human being like you and I and experience this life with all its ups and downs, with all its triumphs and tragedies. The Son of Man has come close to us, so close that he can say, I know what you're going through. He can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he too became fully human. Amen? Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 7. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Daniel says, I saw one like a son of man. And this prophecy, likely written six or 700 BC, makes something more of the Son of Man title. Here the Son of Man is a key end-time figure of the highest importance, whom all peoples will ultimately bow their knee to and whose kingdom will never be destroyed. And indeed, Jesus in his ministry embraced this eschatological role, which is simply a big theological word for saying end-time role. They'll see the Son of Man... Jesus said, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So he embraced this aspect of what the scriptures said the Son of Man would do, this incredible grand role about who the Son of Man is. And the book of Revelation further fleshes out this picture. Look at this verse from Revelation 14, uh, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a Son of Man. Same title, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. It can't be overstated. This figure, this son of man, is spoken of in the grandest of terms. And why is that? What about all the fuss about Jesus humbling himself to become one of us, to become a son of man? to feel as we feel, to hurt as we hurt, to suffer as we suffer. And yes, that is absolutely critical. That is so important as we come into the Easter season and as we get ready to remember, once again, the cross on Good Friday, to remember his sacrifice for all of mankind, the Son of Man suffering for the sons of men. Hugely important, but there's a bigger picture, and it is this. The Son of Man offers hope beyond this life, beyond this life. The cross is only half of the Easter story. You can't have the cross without the resurrection. Amen? Amen. The tomb is empty. Jesus died, yes, but he didn't stay dead. You can't have one without the other. The Son of Man, because of the resurrection, has defeated death. And this is cause for great hope. 
ladies and gentlemen, because the Son of Man has opened the way for us to do the same. None of us will escape death uh, unless the rapture happens, but we nevertheless will overcome it regardless of when God will call our number. And who of us knows when our number is going to be called? Right? We don't know. I was driving home on the QEW last night, and as you know, there's a few more cars there than in Midland on Young Street. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, there was brake lights in front of me, and I thought I was braking fast enough, but I didn't. And then I got very, very close, and I had to pretty well slam on the brakes, and the items in my car flew forward. And I did too, but I had a seatbelt, so it was okay, and I was able to stop uh, before I hit the guy, but it was very close. And then one of the friendly Toronto drivers behind me, pulled up next to me and gave me a nice honk. I didn't look to see if he gave me anything else, but um, <laughs> he did that at least. And I thought, hmm, yeah, that was close. I definitely could have been in an accident there. And of course, as you know, car accidents happen all the time. Whenever I have been on a plane, I think, well, this could be it. And I, you know, that's not, not a great thing to think, but you sort of think that. But then, statistically, it's far more dangerous to drive in a car. Did you know that? Than fly on a plane. But we always think if we're on a plane, like, oh my goodness, this is going to be the one. <laughs> and that's going to be it for me. And you try and, you know, you say a prayer, and, and the, but you sort of try to be okay with that too. But really, you, you know, you obviously don't want the plane to go down. But we get in the car time and time again, or, or we go on a trip and get on, get on a plane. And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long we have. And we want to live. But the great thing about our faith is we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of the unknown. Because we know what's going to happen. We know that because of Jesus Christ, we have hope beyond the grave. So we don't have to live in fear of death. We don't have to live in fear of dying or worried about it or having anxiety around it. And it's not that we, you know, pretend like death isn't a part of life. You know, and I have some concern with where our culture is going, you know, moving away from the idea of, you know, even sort of saying death. Or, you know, we've moved away from words like funeral or memorial. And I understand it. It's, there's nothing wrong with saying celebration of life. But just the idea of saying someone still has died. A life has ended. And yes, celebrate their life. Absolutely. But still, this idea of death, we need to face it in all of its stark, challenging reality. Rather than pretend it's not part of life. The end of life, really. Death. But the gospel... The Son of Man gives us hope in the face of death. Because yes, he died, but then yes, he overcame the grave. And he offers us hope beyond this life. So every chance I get to do a memorial service, a funeral service, celebration of life, whatever term you want to call it, I just so appreciate the chance to extend the hope of Jesus Christ to the family, to the friends of the deceased who come to remember and hopefully find something to cling to. And as we share the eternal words of Scripture, as we point to Jesus Christ, I just pray that God will speak that hope into their hearts and lives and that they will receive that hope that the Son of Man offers to us. In fact, I'm going to be doing one uh, this evening for a, a family that is connected up here, just a small service together with the family. And it'll be extending that hope to them about the Son of Man. We pray that he will be honored. Let's take a look at our summary slides this morning. First of all, as sons of men, we are fragile. We are fragile. Fragile creatures. Am I aware? Are you aware of your humanity, that you are a breath away, as it were, that um, you are a temporary vessel being. We need to embrace our uh, humanity. 
You know, we need to know that we are not invincible. And secondly, Jesus, the Son of Man, relates with us. Have I accepted Christ's ministry to me as the high priest who came as the Son of Man, who can relate to me in what I go through? Have you accepted his ministry to you? Don't you know Jesus wants to minister to you? Sometimes we always feel like we have to sort of, you know, serve God, and we do, and we, can, we should want to serve God, absolutely, but he has served us and wants to serve you in this high priest role where he's saying, I, as the Son of Man, relate to you, how you are tempted, how you, how you, um, how you have uh, challenges you face and trials you go through and sufferings that you are struck with. I relate with you. I sympathize with you because I too took on this flesh, took on this humanity. And it's incredible when you can accept Christ's ministry to you in that regard, where you can understand that he is really serving you in that way, coming alongside and ministering to you as the Son of Man? Have you accepted his ministry to you, personal, empathetic, and intermediary? I love how we're told that he lives forever to make intercession for us to the Father on our behalf. He is the Son of Man who is, you know, in our making intercession. He's, you know, pleading. He's advocating on our behalf because he understands he has lived. He has uh, face the challenges. He has suffered, indeed has died on our behalf. Have you accepted his ministry to you? And it's an ongoing, ongoing process. It's a relationship, you see. And finally, the Son of Man offers hope beyond this life. And it's really just a prayer to say, thank you, Lord, for the hope we have in you that he has offered to all of mankind. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is what I love. There's so many things I love about our gospel, but this is one of them, that it is wide open, that you can simply come and say yes to Jesus, the Son of Man, who offers hope beyond this life. Jesus, the Son of Man, who died, yes, but then defeated the grave three days later, defeated death, rose again victorious. And he says, trust in God, trust in God me. Even though you will die, you will live. Because I have lived. I have overcome. He offers us that hope. And all we need to do is believe it. All we need to do is receive it. We're going to do a closing song in a minute. And let's just bow our heads and pray as we close. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here today. We thank you that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, and you are omnipresent. You are everywhere present at the same time. And this is it's, it's very difficult for us to comprehend. And yet, God, you are uh, with us in such an intimate and powerful way because Jesus Christ has come as the Son of Man to relate with us to experience life as we experience it, to face temptation, to experience suffering and loss. And God, we just give you thanks this morning that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, relates with us. And Lord, I pray for men and women here today who perhaps have not yet received this ministry of the Son of Man. God, that they'll open their hearts to you. God, because you want to come alongside. You want us just to be honest with you. You want us to turn our hearts and lives over to you. And God, you're not looking to condemn, but rather you're looking to forgive and make new and restore. And Lord, we want to walk in that process. So Lord, we, we choose to say yes to this incredible offer of grace here today from the Son of Man. And God, we give you thanks that even though this life has this end point of death that really is unavoidable, and God, we don't know when our number will be called. We don't know how many days we have, but Lord, we know that we don't need to live in fear or anxiety. 
God, because we trust in you, the one who has overcome death, hell, and the grave. We thank you that in you is life, and that life is our life. We pray your blessing upon us now, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's stand and sing a closing song together.